In our post-9-11 world, strict security at our airports has become standard. So how is it possible that someone could steal a commercial airplane and take it on a joyride? This is a story of how a humorous, happy-go-lucky guy nicknamed Bebo did just that in one of the busiest airports in our country. everyone and welcome. I'm your host of Ardent Crime, Tina Williams, where I share with you my candid perspective, research, and thoughts about a true crime case while painting an original art piece related to the case. If you're wanting to learn how to paint as well, then please visit my other channel linked below, Tina Williams Art. As always, listener discretion is advised for today's case. We'll be covering sensitive topics that might be triggering, those topics are suicide, depression, hijacking, plane crash, and mental illness. If any of these topics are triggering for you, I completely understand. If you'd like to skip this video, your mental health is of the utmost importance, and I'll see you on the next one. And now for our case. The crackling of the radio seems standard. Air traffic controller Andrew Jury at the Seattle Terminal Radar Approach Control, an FAA facility near SeaTac, rambles off questions over the radio. The questions are short, clipped, and in typical aviation jargon that most of us would pick up on every third word. Man, I'm a ground service agent. I don't know what that is, came the nervous yet strong voice in response. The pilot responding was not a pilot. In fact, he had never even expressed interest in being a pilot. But suddenly, he was flying a commercial airplane toward Mount Rainier. Air traffic control sounded concerned as he called for him a few times with no response. As he returned from Mount Rainier, he sounded a little shaken when he finally responded, most likely because he had, quote unquote, just lost his lunch from the turbulence near the mountain. Richard Russell was given the nickname Bebo, and uh, he was just a baby, and it stuck. Looking at photos of him, he seemed like a huggable teddy bear ready to make you laugh. And some books can be judged by its cover because friends and family describe Russell just as that. He was a prankster, someone who would make you laugh and was always doing things for fun. Even listening to him over the radio and in this stolen airplane situation, um, he was still doing that. He was still cracking jokes. And something about his personality, something about his humor just makes you want to give him a hug. If it weren't for the fact that he had just stolen a plane and was flying it dangerously over millions of people in Seattle. And 9-11 may have just been two decades prior to that, but it was still fresh in the minds for most of us. I know it still is very, very fresh in my mind. I feel like it just happened. And it wasn't a surprise that people were concerned that this airplane was stolen and flying over Seattle. Nobody knew his intention. I remember when this was happening live and my initial reaction was just complete disbelief. How does somebody steal a commercial airplane when you can't even get through security with a nail clipper? So the aircraft was stolen from plane cargo one at the north end of SeaTac Airport in Seattle, maneuvered to runway 16C, via taxiways A, nearby Alaska Airlines jet on the ground, reported that the aircraft began a takeoff roll with its wheels smoking, and an unauthorized takeoff was made at 7.32 p.m. Um, as I listen to this audio exchange, I have mixed feelings. I'm in awe of how calm he is. As someone who struggled with flying since an emergency landing, I had getting into an airplane alone takes an act of God for me. Um, flying is not my friend, um, much to the disappointment of my pilot father who lived for the air. Uh, but something about an emergency landing can take that thrill away for you. And 
I don't know about you guys, but what, from what I, what I understand, flying a commercial airplane is not easy to do. But here's this person who's never done it before, who not only managed to steal the airplane, but he managed to take it out, take off with it, and is now flying through the air. As air traffic control works to understand Russell's comfort level in the air, he explained that he's played video games before, so he felt comfortable with it. Um, I, I've I've played one of those simulations before, uh, the aircraft ones, and um, I can see how it's pretty close to probably flying an airplane because I have very rarely managed to stay in the air more than a few minutes without crashing. So I, I think they're pretty pretty accurate. Um, it's the ones that you can play at like Dave and Buster's where it's, it feels like a real aircraft type of thing. Uh, but I guess if you play it enough, then he, you can learn how to fly because that's, that's what he said he did. Uh, a commercial pilot would later explain how amazed he was at the maneuvers Russell was able to pull off in the Alaska Airlines Q400, uh, combined with the equally unbelievable feat of actually stealing a commercial airplane from one of the busiest airports in the country. In fact, SeaTac ranks as the ninth busiest airport in the United States. The entire audio exchange, air, air traffic control is working in conjunction with a pilot to help Russell land safely, a commercial pilot. And at no point does Russell actually seem to have any intention of landing. Uh, if you're not going to land, what are you going to do? The question then becomes, what are you going to crash into? And I can only imagine the anxiety everyone was experiencing, wondering just that. It took 25 minutes to notify the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force of the potential threat to national security. 25 minutes. Uh, SeaTac was slow to respond to what was happening, mostly because they weren't even sure if the plane was stolen in the first place. And when I read this, I thought, how is that even possible that you don't know your plane was stolen? But I can see how if you're air traffic control, that's probably not going to be your initial thought, right? I mean, even in post 9-11 world, you're not going to be thinking, did somebody just steal an airplane? Who's flying that? You're probably going to be rationalizing through the whole thing. At least that's what I feel like you would be doing. You would be rationalizing. You'd be saying, oh, maybe there was misinformation, miscommunication, or, or I'm not really saying the correct numbers on the airplane and it's actually something else. So I can see your brain actually trying to rationalize what's actually happening because I know for me, and I'm obviously not an expert, a pilot or air traffic control, but I feel like for me, I'd be thinking that um, I messed up somehow. I got the wrong information and because you would never think in a million years and I grew up with a pilot um, and I, I've been told multiple times flying a commercial airline airplane is not an easy thing to do. So I would probably be thinking there's no way that's a stolen airplane because you, even if you stole the airplane, even if you managed to get into the pilot seat and pull it away from, from the, wherever it was parked, trying to take off with the airplane, you would think that. You wouldn't be able to do that unless you're a pilot. So then you're probably thinking, did a pilot take the plane? What's going on? So I can see kind of how it would have taken a while, but still I would think regardless of what your brain is rationalizing, you're still going to want to initiate your standard protocol until you figure out what's really happening. At least that's what I would think. Um, so finally they responded in response to McDonnell Douglas F-15 Sea Eagles of the Oregon Air National Guard's 142nd Fighter Wing under the command of NORAD were scrambled around 8.15 local time from Portland Air National Guard base to intercept it. Fun facts, uh, my dad worked for McDonnell Douglas, um, so I find this story a little extra cool because, and then my husband worked for NORAD, so, um, it's 
you know, a little cool to have a connection to both these places. And I get a little proud when I hear the military side of things and know I have a connection through both my father and my husband. But anyways, I died digress. Um, both of the F-15s were armed with AIM-9 Sidewinders and AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and went supersonic, generating sonic booms on the way to the Puget Sound area. A KC-135R strato tanker refueling tanker was also scrambled from, from Fairchild Air Force Base to support the F-15 flight. Um, flights in and out of SeaTac Airport were obviously temporarily suspended and uh i can imagine how much more chaos that probably created with it being a busiest airport and flights were, were temporarily suspended even when the two f-15s trailed uh russell they struggled to keep their issued protocol due to russell's erratic flying russell's voice came over the radio again i feel like i need to be what do you think like 5,000 feet at least to be able to pull this barrel roll off, quote unquote. The 108-foot airplane flies upward, the pink and purple dust sky behind him as he suddenly tips over clockwise, then rolls into a diving upside-down swoop toward Puget Sound. It's beautiful if it weren't so stupid. One of the F-15 pilots comes over the radio sounding awestruck. He, quote, he just completed a barrel roll, quote. The second F-15 pilot responded, remaining, remaining professional, but incredulous. Confirm he did a barrel roll, quote. Affirm, unquote, the first pilot responds, laughing, quote. He cleared the surface of the water by approximately... 10 feet, unquote. Pilots are a different breed of people. As I said, I was raised by one and thus surrounded by pilots. I spent a lot of time at airports, in hangars, um, on the runway. Pilots have an amazing ability to remain calm, thankfully, in every situation imaginable and somehow always find humor in the scariest of them um we have movie nights every other sunday night at our house and we our last movie night we watched sully which is about the captain sully who landed the airplane in the hudson river in new york uh excellent movie i know we're a little slow to watch it because it's been out for a while but it is an excellent movie it's a feel-good movie if you're old enough to remember 9 11 i can't believe i'm even saying that because there's people who could be listening to this who weren't even born yet which is crazy to me but um it's just such a feel-good movie but if you watched it then you do have you get to see that yes, pilots stay calm in the most stressful situations. Um, I've seen my dad do it, uh, and obviously, you know, the movies. It's just, they are a different breed of people. I'm grateful for them, and um, it's an incredibly admirable quality, and Russell's humor and calm during this criminal adventure he had is a bittersweet re realization for me because... I think he probably would have been one of the best pilots around had he taken a different course in his life. Um, Russell grew up in Wasilla, Alaska. Um, he was born in Florida, but, but moved to Wasilla at a very young age. Wasilla is just outside of Anchorage. Uh, he, attended, he attended Wasilla High School and where he was a three-sport star for the Wasilla Warriors, placing fifth in state discus and fourth in wrestling. On the football field, he scored six touchdowns as a standout senior fullback. I have no idea what that means. I am not a football fan. I don't think I've ever even watched an entire football game in my life, but I'm sure most of you know what that means. According to his friends and family, the people who loved him, um, he was someone who embraced contact. He received numerous concussions on the field. Uh, if you're familiar with 
the film, I think it's called Concussion with Will Smith, you're, or you're familiar with uh, Aaron Hernandez or CTE, then you can see where I'm going with this. Alaska wouldn't implement a concussion protocol until two years after he graduated, which means he potentially, most likely, would receive a concussion play and potentially even receive multiple concussions in the same day. And his friends and family believe this contributed either directly or indirectly to what happened on this day. CTE is a reluctant understanding from football fans around the country as leaders work tire tirelessly to ignore and cover up the extent of damage and repercussions these injuries can cause. It wasn't until Aaron Hernandez's documentary was released, um, as well as Will Smith's film, that people not only began to understand CTE, but really start to question it. And I think this is clearly a point of contention for people. Um, a lot of people are, it's a polarizing subject. Um, I'm not going to get into it, but uh, it will, it's definitely a polarizing subject. I don't want to get into it, but a lot of people do believe this contributed to Russell's behavior this day. Uh, it will be, it would have been decades before we could truly grasp the ripple effect these injuries have. Uh, if, and I don't even think at the time that Russell was in high school, this was even really being discussed at the time. And it's one of those many incidences that we should at least wonder if it was a direct or indirect consequence of this brain injury. I really think these are the things that we need to consider and think about. And it might make some people uncomfortable, but you know what? I just think for, it's not just these individuals who are suffering from the CTE that are struggling. It's the people around them, potentially the public that can be put in danger by people who are suffering from these injuries. Like, obviously, Russell, although he indicated he didn't want to hurt anybody, he didn't want to inconvenience anybody, he was flying a commercial airplane over millions of people, and he had no idea what he was doing. Um, and he put people, a lot of people, at risk. Um, and I think this is a conversation that should be had. I have a lot of people who care about me, and I'm going to disappoint a lot of them, Russell says he, on the radio. At this point, his voice lost a little bit of his jovialness, sounding somewhat regretful. He sounded sad for the first time on the radio, and he did have a lot of people that cared about him. Dozens of people came out to speak about him after that day. Friends said that everyone had a quote-unquote Bebo story. A college friend named Pete Schaefers explains, quote, you could count on him. Dirty work didn't phase Russell. He was super good-natured, always. I never saw him when he wasn't, unquote. Russell met his future wife while in college, and the two were married in 2012. They opened a bakery shortly after called Hannah Marie's Artisan Breads and Pastries. But missing their families, the bakery would soon close and they would move to Seattle to be closer to Hannah's family. Russell wished they had moved to Alaska, but he was unable to convince her. He loved Wasilla. He wanted to go back there. He wanted to bring Hannah home. Um, but she also wanted to be back in Seattle and close to her own family. And she went out. Um, in a passive manner, Russell described exactly what his plans were that evening. Quote, I wouldn't know how to land it. I wasn't really planning on landing. I just kind of want to do a couple of maneuvers, see what it can do but before I put her down. You know? Unquote. Days before, Russell had saved a meme on his Pinterest board that said, quote, No matter how fast I run, I cannot run away from this pain unquote. And I think that's very telling. Um, if you're not familiar with Pinterest, I, I'm addicted to Pinterest and it, I don't think too many people are, but I love Pinterest. 
I think it's just I'm a visual person and I love just seeing all the I, I just I love Pinterest. It's basically where you can save images to board so you can have, um, you know, like a if you want to do like ideas for my kitchen board and then you can save all the pictures to that board on Pinterest and because you're selecting these pictures more of similar pictures will start to pop up in your feed and give you more ideas it could be anything from like kitchen ideas to weight loss inspiration to you know um, hairstyles to um, organization anything you can think of you can create a board for it uh, and you could save memes and quotes and, you know, for me, I even have, I, I suffer from general anxiety disorder and I have an anxiety board for myself and it has things on it that help like, you know, meditation exercises, some exercises you can do when dealing with anxiety. Cause when you're in the middle of an anxiety attack, you're not remembering all of this stuff. You're very consumed by what's happening to you at the moment. So for me, I have this Pinterest board and I can go there and not have to try to remember the exercise. It's just right there. So for me, that's what I have. And I think for Russell, he was saving some quotes to that he related to, that he felt comfortable with. And that was one of them. On a few occasions on the over the radio, Russell apologizes for ruining people's days. He seemed genuinely distressed over the chaos he knew he had created. As he soared over Puget Sound... The skies purpling and darkening. As night grew closer, Russell became reflective. Quote, I'm just a broken guy. Got a few screws loose, I guess. Never really knew it until now. Unquote. It breaks my heart because when he says that, you can, you can almost feel what he's saying. You can almost... I don't know. It's it's a realization that he had. He he considers himself broken, and that just makes me really really sad for him. Um, and I wish he had obviously taken a different path and tried to find help. But it sounds like he didn't even know he needed it really until that moment. He soars over the Olympics and vocalizes his thoughts, awestruck by the beauty. Quote, the sights went by so fast. I was thinking, like, I'm going to have this moment of serenity, you know. I'll be able to take in all the sights. There's a lot of pretty stuff, unquote. He says, quote, but I think they're prettier in a different context, unquote. In one of his final moments, he had managed to sum up life in just a couple of sentences. The fuel was now dangerously low, and his time was coming to an end. Not for long, he said. I feel like one of my engines is going out or something. And I don't think he realized that he was speaking in such a metaphoric way that a lot of us will probably take from it. Listening to the audio, um... But it is, it is very heartbreaking what he was experiencing. He was such a young guy. He seemed to have such a sense of humor about things. Um, even in these moments, you can, you can see him kind of warring with himself over everything. And it's a struggle for him and you can tell, and it's one of those things where it's like, you just wish you could do something to help him. Um, the air traffic control was being very surprisingly supportive, I guess you can say, which I guess I can understand because you obviously want to keep him calm for multiple reasons. You don't know at that moment what he's planning on doing. Um, he, the air traffic control kept trying to help him point him in the direction of getting him to land uh, moments after those words when he says not for long I feel like one of my engines is going out or something his plane crashed on Keytron Island a tiny uninhabited island it says uninhabited it, it did have um, some residents on there 
but it wasn't like it. It, it wasn't like a. Uh, I, was, I forgot the name of the island for a second. The one right across from Seattle. Uh, I keep wanting to say Bridgecrest, which is the name of my <laughs> finance company for my car, but it's not Bridgecrest. Um, why am I blanking on the name? I'm not going to remember it. But anyways, it's not like uh, any of the islands there that are densely populated. Uh, there was a, you know, there was a few cabins here and there. Um, FBI states later that Russell died from multiple traumatic injuries and concluded that Russell's final descent was intentional. Uh, they did detect a, an actual, not a nose dive, but they detected it, it by the way he was flying. They can tell it wasn't an intentional descent. And it looked like Russell was trying to make sure he crashed somewhere where there was no one. Re Russell's flight from beginning to end lasted 73 minutes and ended at 8.46 p.m. on August 10th, 2018, a beautiful Seattle day. Alaska Air reported the event to shareholders as a, quote, fully insured event with no deductibles, unquote, stating the loss as minimal. Delayed by the Stalacombe Anderson Island Ferry, firefighters from West Pierce Fire and Rescue and other nearby departments arrived on the island about an hour and a half after the crash, where they then contended with the island's very thick brush. The fire burned a two-acre area, but was extinguished by the following morning. No injuries were reported to residents of the sparsely populated island, despite the crash site being in close proximity to at least one cabin, which was occupied at the time of the incident. The Port of Seattle offered some standard post-event recaps and safeguards that would be expected, but also added that, quote, physical fail-safe measures may be possible, but costs are considerable, unquote, indicating that preventing something like this in the future is possible, but due to the expense of it, probably wouldn't be happening. Uh, questions around this arose about insider ways for airport personnel to hijack planes that would be far more nefarious be for far more nefarious reasons and seemingly those concerns have been brushed under the rug by the FBA, FBI and the FAA. Uh, <laughs> it's comforting, isn't it? Russell was a airport employee. Um, he was on, he was working on tarmac. So that was his way of getting obviously to the airplane. Um, he did help uh, airplanes uh, taxi backwards from the uh, the gates and stuff so he had experience with that I don't think that somebody like myself who isn't working at the airport who has no experience with airplanes except for her dad being a pilot which is really no experience would have been able to pull this off it had to be somebody I think that was working with the airplanes um, other air, air, uh, airline pilots would come out later and say, yeah, you know, the ones that work with him say, yeah, he was always kind of curious about the airplane and would ask questions in the cockpit and stuff like that. So um, he had some knowledge. Obviously, he wasn't he wasn't a commercial commercial airline pilot, but he did he did have some some knowledge. Uh, Russell did manage a text to his wife during the flight, telling her that she deserved better. Official state that never managed to understand the why of what he did. Uh, but then again, something so simple wouldn't be as conclusive in a report, would it? Um, Bebo stated his why very clearly. He just wanted to see what the plane would do. See the sights, have a serene moment before he took her down. And himself along with her. And that's exactly what he did. And... It's, you, you think, how can something like this happen? Obviously, it's, it's, it's scary to think that somebody could have stolen the plane. But it's not the first time that this has happened. Um, there was an incident before 9-11. The 1999 Air Botswana incident occurred when Chris Fatswe, a Botswana airline pilot, killed himself by crashing a plane into the airport apron and a group aircraft of aircraft 
at Sir Suretsi Kama International Airport in Gaborone, Botswana. He was the only casualty. His actions effectively crippled operations for Air Botswana. He was a pilot, a little bit different. But on May 25th, 2003, and I actually didn't even hear about this until researching this Alaska Airlines incident, a Boeing 727 airliner registered N844AA, and I'll put that in, in the video description below, was stolen at Quacho de, and I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering this, Fevereiro Airport in Luanda, Angola, prompting a worldwide search by law enforcement intelligence agencies in the United States. No trace of the aircraft has since been found. That's post 9-11. In fact, 2003, so not even that long after 9-11. Um, and I looked it up, and they, they don't know what happened to this airplane, uh, a Boeing 727. I do want to clarify on something I said earlier when I said, actually with the trigger warnings, was I used the term hijacking. Uh, it's actually not hijacking. These planes are stolen. So the difference is, from what I understand, a hijacking, you have passengers on there. If you don't have passengers, they consider the plane stolen, and it's a lesser offense um, for obvious reasons. What I want to do right now is share a little audio clip. I think it's a, it's a good clip because it kind of gives a little bit of everything uh, on that fateful day. I'm sorry, say that again. Sorry, uh, my mic get, came off. I threw up a little bit. Uh, you know, I, uh, hold oh, shoot. Man, I'm sorry about this. I hope this doesn't ruin your day. 22, cross rail and six left contact. Yep. Just flying the plane around. You seem comfortable with that? Oh, hell yeah, it's a blast, man. I played video games before, so I, uh, you know, I know what I'm doing a little bit. Okay, and uh, and you can see all the terrain around you. Uh, you've got no issue with visibility or anything? No, nah, everything's peachy, peachy clean. Just did a little circle around Rainier. It's beautiful. Um, I think I got some gas to go check out uh, the Olympics. And, uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, Rich, do you know, uh, are you able to tell what altitude you're at? Only one six left. Iconic tower for your landing clearance. I threw up all inside of his bed. You'll be released when you when you taxi out. No. American 600. Fast to join. I was thinking about it, and then uh, probably a good thing I did. 494. Mexico 494 Monitor Tower 1. Our cops did join up. Yeah, that's all mumbo jumbo. I have no idea what all that means. I wouldn't know how to uh, punch it in. I'm I'm uh, off autopilot. Okay. See ya. Make a right turn on Bravo. 5,500. Get me to the jets. No, I'm not taking you to any jets. I'm actually keeping you away from aircraft that are trying to land at SeaTac. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I don't want to screw with that. I'm glad, uh, glad you're not, uh, you know, screwing up everyone else's day. On account of me. All the traffic in front of you, make the days chain up around on to uh, Alpha. We're going to keep people clear this runway for... 446, can we just shut down? I'm, uh, I'm down to 2100. I started at like 30-something. Rich, you said you're at uh, 2,100 pounds of fuel left? Yeah, uh, I don't know what the burn it, burn itch, burn out is like on, uh, uh, on takeoff, but, uh, yeah, it burned quite a bit faster than I expected. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, we have the fuel inside. Kind of car? There is the, uh, the runway just off your right side in about a mile. Do you see that? That's the uh, that's the uh, that's McCord uh, Field. Oh man, those guys would rough me up if I uh, tried landing there. I think I I think I might mess something up there too. I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, hopefully, oh, they probably got anti-aircraft. No, they don't have any of that stuff. Uh, we we're just trying to find a place for you to land safely. Yeah, not quite ready to bring it down just yet, but holy smokes, I gotta, I gotta stop looking at the fuel because it's going down quick. 
Okay, Rich, uh, if you could, if, could you start a left-hand turn, and uh, we'll, we'll take you down to the uh, southeast. Again, very tragic. Thank you guys for joining me. If you have any suggestions on cases, send me a message or post in the comments below. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you on my next video.